Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour back in our Father's Word, book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 16, we're going to get there. It is, symbol sim excuse me, it is symbolic, and we are so close to the end that this symbolism has to do with, hey, you don't have time to do anything, basically. The enemy's right there on in sight. He's coming right over the hill. The king of Babylon. This has to do prophetically then with the king of Babylon in the end times. So with that having been said, a word of wisdom from our father, chapter 16, the great book of Jeremiah, let's go with it. Verse 1 reads, The word of the Lord came also unto me, saying, verse 2, Thou shalt not take thee a wife, neither shalt thou have sons or daughters in this place. Why? You, you don't have time. You need to get packed up. The end is coming. That's what it has reference to. The, and, of course, for us, it means the king of Babylon, the false Christ. is, is uh, When the swarming and those four events in the last lecture that Father warned us of, you know you're getting there. Verse 3, For thus saith the Lord concerning the sons and concerning the daughters that are born in this place, and concerning their mothers that bear them, and concerning their fathers that begat them in this land. Verse 4, They shall die of grievous deaths, they shall not be lamented, neither shall they be buried, but they shall be as dung upon the face of the earth, and they shall be consumed by the sword, by the famine, and their carcasses shall be meat for the fowls of heaven, and for the beast of the earth. Now, now absorb that for a moment prophetically. Like I said, this is symbolism. It's not actual. Okay. So, therefore, those that remain there after the false one comes and sets up camp, what are they? They're spiritually dead. They're, the true spirit is no longer in them. They have accepted the false one. They're quite happy with that. And there they are in this great city that we're talking about here, worshiping the false messiah, thinking that Christ has returned. But here in this case, it is the king of Babylon. And of course, the king of Babylon and the great book of Revelation is none other than Satan himself. Verse 5. For thus saith the Lord, Enter not into the house of mourning, neither go to lament nor bemoan them. For I have taken away my peace from this people saith the Lord, even loving kindness and mercies. This is a way of correcting. You know, and why is it they won't accept uh, the fact? They don't know any better. They truly are deceived in the end times into believing this is Christ. And, and they're worshiping him. They're celebrating. That's why God turns his back on them. He wants nothing to do with them because they're committing idolatry to the highest degree. They're worshiping the very one that wanted to sit upon the throne of God, that's to say Antichrist, Satan himself. You know, there's, there are deaths uh, worse than death of the soul. I'm sorry, death of the flesh. It's the death of the soul. To, to, to be spiritually dead is spiritual homicide. And false teaching brings that to pass, and, and so it is that uh, our Father uses these things to correct, and so it is. Uh, okay, we'll go with the next verse, please. Verse 6. Both the great and the small shall die in this land. They shall not be buried, neither shall men lament for them, nor cut themselves, nor make themselves bald for thee. In other words, this is going back to the law written in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 28, where heathenistic practices of religion, where they would cut themselves for the dead, or they would um, um, 
sackcloth and ashes. He said, don't, don't, don't mourn for them. Don't lament for them. Right? They're celebrating. They think they're doing what is right. And you know, unfortunately today, when people teach contrary to the word of God, when they teach traditions of men, and you can see people being lined up, basically, taught in a way that when this false one that he's talking about here, that he's in sight, he's coming, the king of Babylon. When, when we come to that point now, people are geared in their minds, they have a mindset, better said, that is, will receive him when he appears, will worship him. How fantastic it is that they will not know they're doing wrong, therefore they will be celebrating. Verse 7, Neither shall men tear themselves for them in mourning, to comfort them for the dead. Neither shall men give them the cup of consolation to drink for their father or for their mother. That cup of con consolation being what? They won't realize they're spiritually dead. Th this is the sad part of uh, deception, is people are so embedded within traditions of men, well, uh, the preacher said it would be all right. The preacher said that's the way it's going to be. Have you ever really questioned yourself, what does God say it's going to be? See, it doesn't matter what some preacher that may come in the name of Christ tells you. It's what this word says. This, thus saith the Lord God. Don't moan or groan or lament or feel sorry for those that are deceived. They bring it upon themselves. That doesn't alleviate or um, uh, release you from teaching truth and from planting seeds. Because some of them we're going to save. Some of them are going to recognize the truth. They're going to know there is a false Christ and there is a true Christ. And they're going to know from the book of Revelation that the false Christ comes first. And they're not going to be deceived. They will not be spiritually dead, but they will be living, serving the living God, anointed and blessed to do God's work. Verse 8, Thou shalt not also go into the house of feasting to sit with them to eat and to drink. Well, what is this they're feasting about? Second Advent. They think it's taking place. They're going to be celebrating all over the place. You know, when this supernatural entity, who is we call the false Christ, when he appears on earth and performs miracles that he can snap his fingers and make lightning come down from heaven, how many people, even atheists, are going to whore after him, thinking he's the true Christ, and they've been mistaken, that he's absolutely here, because they've never seen anything like that. Even though God, in Revelation chapter 13, uh, verse 12 and 13, tells them this, tells you in advance, this is how it's going to be. To warn you, whereby you do not participate in the feasting at that time and celebrating the return of the false Messiah. Verse 9. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will cause to cease out of this place in your eyes, you're going to see it. And in your days, the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness and the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. Well, now, who is this bridegroom and the bride? Well, I thought that's what they were celebrating. Well, that's what they think they're celebrating. But they're celebrating the false Christ. The true Christ is no longer there. And the bride, which is God's elect, they're certainly not there unless they're delivered up before the false Christ to bring a witness through the Holy Spirit to the whole world, as it's written in Mark 13. It is void at that time because of the feasting and the celebrating. And the, they feel the second advent, but all it is is the woe, woe, woe. The three woes of the great book of Revelation, the false one, standing in the holy place where he's not supposed to. Uh, does your church teach that? Do you know why that's very important? If you truly have a church that follows God, because there are seven churches 
in the book of Revelation in chapter 2 and 3. The only two churches that Christ was happy with was Smyrna and Philadelphia. Do you know what those two churches taught that set them aside from the others? You should if you want to please Christ. They knew who those were that claimed to be of our brother Judah, but were of the synagogue of Satan and worship Satan instead, and you would not participate with it. If your church doesn't teach that, you're in a heap of hurt, my friend. Um, that's the only two churches that Christ was happy with. They taught who those were that claimed to be of our brother Judah and did lie. They were Kenites, sons of Satan, and of the synagogue of Satan. Um, it's, it's written in the book of Revelation. Have you ever read it? Chapter 2 and chapter 3? I'll even help you a little further. 2.10 and 3.10 gives you a real good look at them. Which church do you belong to? It isn't the name over the door. It's what is taught within that group. Is it the word of God? Or is it the traditions of men? In that day, the true bridegroom will not be there. The false bridegroom will be there, and he will be deceiving many. Therefore, God's elect will not be there unless they are delivered. Verse 10, And it shall come to pass, when thou shalt show this people all these words, and they shall say unto thee, Wherefore hath the Lord pronounced all this great evil against us? Or what is our iniquity? What's our sin? Or what is our sin that we have committed against the Lord our God? They truly don't know. Why? Because they feel they're worshiping God when it's none other than Satan himself. That's, this is why Paul made it very clear in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He said, don't let that first letter deceive you about our gathering back to Christ meaning the so-called rapture doctrine. Don't let, any, don't let that first letter deceive you. Don't let some spirit, some angel, or anything. Christ will not gather back to us until after the son of perdition is revealed standing in Jerusalem, the holy place, claiming to be God, claiming to be Christ. You're warned. Well, many people don't take that warning because they're not taught. They listen to men rather than reading God's word. And that's what he's talking about. Why? The reason they won't cry out, they don't realize what they're doing is wrong because of false teaching. Verse 11. Then shalt thou say unto them, Because your fathers have forsaken me, saith the Lord, and have walked after other gods, lowercase, and have served them, and have worshipped them, and have forsaken me, and have not kept my law. That is, that is the honest truth. God is being very, very straightforward and laying the truth right on the line. Why? They're, they don't realize because they haven't studied God's word. You know, to, what is really sad, his law, people don't know the difference. The average Christian doesn't know the difference between law, ordinances, and statutes. They, they feel that all law is done away with when it was only the blood ordinances, that part, because Christ's blood covered all. The law concerning thou shalt not steal is still very much in place. The law of gravity is still very much in place. When, when you jump off of something, you go down. That's God's law of gravity. It still exists. It's still there. So... You must know the difference in what God nailed to the cross with the Son on that cross, that Christ became those things. But the rest of the law remains, and he says, you're not paying attention to it. And the sad part about this, I've mentioned several times the verse, chapter 7, verse 23, where God lays it out where a child can understand how to please him. He said, hey, all you've got to do is follow my commandments. That's his law. I will be your God. You will be my people, and it will be well with you. You can't go out here reading fantasy land stuff 
or listening to the traditions of men that might tell you, you don't have to understand the book of Revelation. You're going to be gone. That's not biblical. That's fiction. And it will put you in the group you're reading about here that they don't know what they're doing wrong because they're doing what the preacher said. They didn't bother to read God's Word to see what Father has to say. That's what's very important, beloved, that you know what our Father says. He will be your God, and you can be His people. But, and, and it will be well with you, but you've got to do it His way. There is a controversy in this world, and Satan is really turning up the heat right at this time. He will take advantage and try to work in in any way he can. It's not going to happen. We have the victory. Next verse, please. Verse 12. And we have done worse than, and ye rather have done worse than your fathers. For behold, you walk every one after the imagination of his evil heart, that they may not hearken unto me. In other words, you listen to men, you don't listen to me. That's why he sent you this letter called the Word of God so that you could hear what God has to say. It is so simple. And um, the sad part is, they won't listen to our Father. They'd rather, they'd rather listen to some ratchet jaw, saying soothing things, men pleasers, rather than pleasing the living God. You don't want to go there, my friend. We, we are in times that are critical at this time. It's called the end times. And that's what this chapter is about. It's God telling you, you, you don't have time to raise any children anymore. That is to say, to start, you, you want to be ready to travel. The enemy's coming, the king of Babylon. And this has nothing to do with having children today. You continue living your life as you would otherwise, but no one understand that uh, spiritually we're all the same age anyway. Verse 13. Therefore will I cast you out of this land into a land that ye know not, neither ye nor your fathers, and there shall ye serve other gods day and night, where I will not show your fav you favor. In other words, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, that's future Babylon. I'm going to let them take over if you're going to listen to them. As far as you're concerned, this has nothing to do with God's election. He's promised us the victory. I mean, he, he has a wing over us, and he protects us. Nothing can harm us. But if you want to be deceived, he will certainly allow you to. You can, you can go right on down Primrose Lane. Well, what was it they were doing wrong? They were worshiping other traditions and gods, false religions, other than worshiping God himself. You know, there's only one Father. And if you're not worshiping Him, you're in a heap of hurt. And if you listen to men and never, never get into this letter that God sent you, or, or never study under a teacher that teaches this word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, how are you going to know what God has to say to you? You could pray, but you see, the foundation He gave you in this letter and you must absorb it so that you're standing on solid ground and nothing can shake you. Christ is our rock. He is the foundation. When you are on him solid, nothing can shake you. Nothing can bother you. God's word will come to you with understanding whereby you can help those poor, miserable wretches that are deceived by the traditions of men. Pull them out of the very fire of deception and bring them into the light of the living God, serving the true Father rather than some false religion. Future Babylon. Babel is just exactly that. God is not the author of confusion. That's to say Babel. God is the author of peace. And when you are truly studying God's Word, and when you realize the nearness of your Heavenly Father, when you realize His promises that He always keeps, you have nothing to fear. 
You have nothing at all to even be concerned about other than learning truth whereby you can assist and help those that are deceived and certainly to not be deceived yourself. Future Babylon is going to be a tough time, my friend. You, you, just how tough will it be? Well, as long as you stay on the rock, you're fine. But if you read Mark chapter 13, Christ said himself, for the elect's sake, I've shortened the time. Because if I let it go the full three and a half years, there would be no flesh saved. That, that's how convincing Satan is. So you want to be mentally prepared for that. You want to be spiritually prepared for that, better said. Our Father will always help you. He will always aid you, especially if you're in the business of helping others. He will always help you because that's what keeps the word spread. That's what keeps the word going. Verse 14. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that it shall no more be said, the Lord liveth, that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. It's, th that was a wonderful thing. God delivered his children right out of Egypt, but then before, you know, 40 days later, they're worshiping a golden calf. They're not going to remember him for that great exploit of delivering the children. Well, what are they going to do then? Verse 15. But the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands whither he hath driven them. And I will bring them again into their land that I, have, that I gave unto their fathers. This is yet future even to this time. When, when God will bring all of his children, you won't have to ask a brother. Again, future, you, you can rest assured it is. But he will lead, guide, and direct for those that have the truth. And at that time and at that change, certainly, he will bless and he will raise up. And, and we, God's elect, will overcome. Overcome, why? Because Christ is with us. You know, he alleviates the anxiety of the unknown and brings in the truth and the solid rock of that, that we stand on, whereby you're not shook up at every little wind that comes along. You know that you're in good standing with him, that he is using you, and that you have a destiny. That future time is coming, and how wonderful that will be. Verse 16, Behold, I will send for many fishers, saith the Lord, and they shall fish them. And after will I send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and from every hill and out of the holes of the rocks, right from where the locust army has driven them from where the locust army has tried to take over everything. I will send out God's elect that will be fishers of men, that will be hunters of lost souls, that will be driven to teach God's word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, whereby traditions of men cannot make it void, but bring forth the truth of the living God, whereby a person can feel at peace have peace of mind in knowing they have the truth. They cannot be deceived. That great time of deception is coming. That's what the symbology of this great book is about. This chapter is about is seeing that you are well informed. Well informed by what? The Word of God. Not man. Not this man or any other man. But the living God. He said, I want to make a fisherman out of you. I want to make a hunter lady out of you. I want you to hunt lost souls. I want you to participate in seeing that that word goes forth, that saves souls, that strengthens souls. It's like a guiding light in a dark world that shows people this way to salvation, this way away from the false one, this way to truth, which is to say the living word, the word of God. That's what the fishers and the hunters and digging out the holes of the rock um, from the rocks. Um, 
I might take advantage to say also that old girdle that he hid in the rocks that was all mildewed. He said, I, I want you to bring me a fresh one. I want to put my people around me. I want to bring them home. I want to wear them close to my heart. That's what God is saying. Are you part of that group that he wants near him? Or do you belong to that other group? God loves his children. We serve a God of love. Verse 17. For mine eyes are upon all their ways. They are not hid from my face. Neither is their iniquity hid from my eye, mine eyes. In other words, God sees what's happening. He knows. He's aware. This is why you don't even have to pray out loud. He even knows what you're thinking. And when you're just trying, he will touch you. He will assist you. So, uh, you know, many people, they don't know who they are. Many people don't even realize there's a house of Judah and a house of Israel. How could they realize they were of the house of Israel if they didn't even know the difference between the house of Judah and the house of Israel? Where is the house of Israel? God knows, and many of God's elect know. They, when they were driven, those ten northern tribes were taken captive by the Assyrian. They later went over the Caucasus Mountains, called Caucasians, settled Europe, many coming to Canada and the Americas, settling here, becoming a superpower of the nation of nations. Didn't happen by accident. God knows. God observes. There's a reason for things. There is a reason for the season, and the season here is the coming of the false one. It's something you don't even have to worry about. Because you have power over him in Christ's name. Therefore, God observes, he looks, he sees, he understands, he assists, he helps. He knows where you are and what you're doing. And, and therefore, he can use you when you know also. He's all-knowing. Verse 18. And first, I will recompense their iniquity and their sin double because they have defiled my land. They have filled mine inheritance uh, with the corcuses of their detestable and abominable things. Those idols and the things that they have given to idols, they've absolutely ruined the holy place with them. And of course, Satan's body being in the holy place is the height of abomination. It is the time of abomination. It is the abomination spoken of by Daniel the prophet when he would say, when you see the abomination standing in the holy place where he ought not, because he's not a, he's not a, a um, condition, he's an actuality, a person, the abominable one. And, and so it is that uh, God is not happy about that naturally. It is Satan taking over God's house or trying to. He can't get it done because God has his election. His election is his true house wherever they are. They make up that many-membered body. But uh, a double caring and a double taking care of those that sin by into to worship antichrist you might say well how could that be double they're not going to make it in the first resurrection they're going to have to wait till the end of the millennium maybe then and maybe not that's why double and, and uh, if you don't understand the time of the millennium where God's elect teach with Christ as it's written in Revelation chapter 20, verse 5, for a thousand years, trying to save souls still yet before the final judgment and the walk into the lake of fire for those that can't, that do not make it. So they will have an opportunity. God is a loving God. He loves his children. And certainly he wants them to have an opportunity to know and understand the truth other than from some ratchet jaw. Verse 19, <clears throat> O Lord, my strength, that's my strength and my protection, and my fortress, 
and my refuge in the day of affliction. The Gentiles shall come unto thee from the ends of the earth and shall say, Surely our fathers have inherited lies, vanity, and things wherein there is no profit. You know, you, if you look forward on to the time of Revelation chapter uh, 21, and in verses 20 through 24, you have all the house of Israel and Judah right there at Jerusalem. Who is, who is this? Who are these nations that are coming from afar to worship God? It's the Gentiles. They're coming to worship him. Why? Because they love him. And God loves all of his children. That's the way he created us, the way we are. He loves us the way we are. And, and so it is that uh, that's what he's talking about. He loves his children. He wants them around him, but they have to love him naturally. Or there is a place for them. And unfortunately, that place is not a real popular place. There's no profit there. When they wake up to the fact they've been lied to, they've been deceived, and, and generation after generation, these lies have come down that are misleading, rather than getting into God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, finally the bell rings and they wake up and they realize our Father is on the throne. Verse 20, Shall a man make gods unto himself? And they are no gods? Do you think you can work out your own salvation? No. Why? Well, God created your being, your soul. He wants it. All souls belong to him. And there's not going to be, this is what caused Satan his problem. He wanted to work his own salvation out. He wanted to become God. And if you think you're bold enough, you could create a God, so you're taking the same stand. It's not going to work with our Father. Verse 21, to complete the chapter. Therefore, behold, or therefore you look here. I will do this once. Uh, I will this once cause them to know. I will cause them to know mine hand and my might. And they shall know that my name is the Lord. And how precious it is to be able to read that in, in the, the manuscripts, which when Lord is given in all upper cases, it's Yahweh. I am that I am. And certainly, when they will know it is him, it's when Ezekiel 38 and 39 come to pass, when the enemy really comes against the house of God, and God won't let us war with them. He intends to do it himself. Well, why would God want to do it himself? He wants them to know that he is God. He can take care of business. There will be no atheist in that crowd because they're going to see him feel him and know the awesome might of his powerful hand okay hey don't miss any of these lectures in jeremiah there you have it symbolism king of babylon just over the hill always be ready all right bless your hearts listen a moment won't you please the strong's exhaustive concordance of the bible is an invaluable tool to the serious bible student the Strong's Concordance lists every word used in the Bible and every passage where the word utilized may be found in the scriptures. With the assistance of a reference numbering system, the English reader may easily translate any word back to the original Hebrew, Chaldea, or Greek in which God's word was written. The Companion Bible is a unique study Bible. In addition to the text of the King James Version Bible, an extra wide margin contains a wealth of information not found in other Bibles. A system of structures or outlines employed by the Companion Bible will allow the readers to rightly divide the Bible. The use of these structures help the reader follow the subject matter, and therefore they are critical to an understanding of God's Word. The 198 appendixes found in the Bible cover a wide variety of topics and information which will enlighten your studies. The Companion Bible and Strongest Concordance are a must for the serious Bible student. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. 
If the Spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Once you do that, please never ask a question about some reverend or some denomination or organization. We don't judge people. We have one judge. It's our Heavenly Father. Leave that department to Him. You do have the right for spir to spiritual discernment, giving you the right to know who you should listen to, who you should not, to discern whether something be of truth or fiction, and certainly what a blessing it is. Spiritual discernment is a gift from God. Now, you that listen to, to the broadcast uh, uh, by a short, around the world, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. It's always a pleasure hearing from you. It certainly is. Now, got a prayer request? You don't need the number or an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking. All you have to do is talk to him. He, what does he want from you? He wants your love. He wants you to love him. That's the main thing he wants. And that brings prayer, answers to prayer. Let him know that. Once you do that, Father, around the globe, we come. We ask that you need, guide, direct, Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. We're going to go with Bernie from California. Is there anyone in hell right now, and are they on the other side of the gulf? The word hell makes an interesting study if you have a strong concordance. There is no such thing right at this time as hell. It doesn't happen until after the judgment, the great white throne judgment. You cannot be sent to hell until after God himself judges you. And these people that like to judge people prior to that to hell are breaking every law of God in judging. So it's common sense. No one goes to hell until after the great white throne judgment. Now, it's really a very simple thing to check out what the word hell is really translated from into the English. It is either from the surel in Hebrew, which means the grave, or it is in the New Testament, most often Gehenna, which is the garbage pit in the Valley of Hinnon. It was the garbage pit of Jerusalem where they threw trash and it burned and smoldered and dead animals and maggots and what have you on those animals where God, Christ said, that's an example of hell. But it doesn't exist yet. It's the lake of fire that is able to even destroy a soul much less a body. And that does not happen until the, the um, end of, um, of the millennium at that time. That's the final judgment, then and then only. Margaret from New York, where in the Bible does it say to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. Whether you're good, bad, or ugly, you have to go to God for judgment. And there is a place now called paradise, and there is a gulf in the middle of it. Those that overcome are on one side, and those that don't are on the other. And um, so it is. Waiting judgment. Waiting the millennium, and then judgment. Barbara from North Carolina, would you please explain the three sixes? I I'm going to assume you mean the three sixes of the great book of Revelation 666. It is really very simple. <clears throat> First of all, it's the six seals, the sixth seal, and then it's the sixth trump, and then it's the sixth vial. They're all the same. The same thing happens in all of those events. That's why Satan's number is 666, because, <clears throat> excuse me, he comes at the sixth seal, the sixth trump, and the sixth vial. That's 666. That's his number. That's when he shows up. Now, all you've got to do then is go and read what the sixth seal says. It's the appearance of Antichrist. Read the sixth trump. What does it say? Appearance of Antichrist. Read the sixth vial, wrath of God. What does it say? Appearance of Antichrist. Uh, Kevin from Missouri. I want to know where the scripture is that says that a man must work. Document for me that God says that a man must work. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. It lays it out where a child can understand it. 
exactly what does it say? It says, if a man won't work, don't feed him. There's nothing will put you to work faster than somebody not to feed you or give you a handout when there's a job waiting for you there that you could go to and feed yourself and your family. Okay. And, and um, <clears throat> in Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, it says a man that won't feed his own family and work to do it is worse than an infidel. So I, I don't know. I really don't understand where you're coming from. Do you think God doesn't, you know, it's, um, uh, that was what was placed on Adam coming out the gate. <clears throat> he gave work to even the first creation, hunters, fishers. That's work. You don't hunt, you don't eat. You don't fish, you don't eat. Then there came Eth Heth Ha Adam, which he, he wanted a husbandman. That's a farmer. You don't farm, you don't eat. Okay? There you got it. God says work. Um, Carol from South Carolina. My question is about the wine in the Bible. Uh, if the wine is intended to a is indeed a fermented wine. Or is it grape juice? Because the pastor at our church says that Jesus never would have consumed wine or made water into fermented wine. Thank you for your response. Your pastor's got just a wee bit of a problem. Because in John 2.10, if he's, well, if he's intelligent enough to read manuscripts, where it says, and they drunk, that means they're, inebriated. After taking the wine Christ made, they're drunk. They are inebriated. They are staggering drunk. Okay? So, uh, is your preacher right? Well, I, I've had quite a bit of grape juice in my life. I love grape juice. It's never made me drunk. Okay? Fermented wine will. You know, your preacher is just a little bit off track because he misses the whole act of fermentation. It is purification. It purifies the grape juice. Grape juice has got junk in it, trash and everything else. When it ferments, it comes to the top, they skim it off, and it becomes pure. That's what it means, the blood of Christ. Don't pass, your pastor shouldn't pass off some trashy juice for the pure blood of Christ, symbolically speaking, symbolically, symbolically speaking. Teresa from Virginia. Pastor, I was recently visited by a local church and I invited them in to plant some seeds. Is this okay, a thing to do? I appreciate your program. Keep up the good work. Well, we're going to, hey, whatever God leads you. If God leads you to do a thing like that, hey, go for it. All right, that's <clears throat> that's fine, and, and and praise God. Maybe they listen. Maybe a seed grew. Russell from Tennessee, Pastor Murray, can you please explain to me predestination? <clears throat> God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe upon Him should not perish, but have eternal life. This word that is utilized here and translated eternal, meaning from the time in the first earth age that the soul was created, it does not cease existing even into the eternity. It means a great more than just to um, have eternal life. Eternal means from the beginning of creation. So really there's no, uh, pre-existence is a misnomer because um, we've existed from the beginning. But to say we pre-existed in the first earth age, that we can say. As a matter of fact, in Romans chapter 8, following verse uh, 28, uh, God ord foreordained many people. Why? Because they earned it in the first earth age. And as it would say in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, God would say, I chose you before the foundations of this earth. <clears throat> that itself means predestination pre-existence, and foreordination. Read Romans 8, start with about 24, 26. Many times a Christian doesn't even know what to pray for. Therefore, God will intercede in a predestined life. Uh, Booker from, I think that's Illinois. 
First Timothy in first in Timothy chap first Timothy chapter four verse five. Can you please explain this to me? The the fifth verse states that all of God's animals are sanctified. A lot of people might say, well, that means we can eat them all. No, back up to verse 3. What does it say? So don't let anybody judge you in marriage. And don't let anybody judge you in eating food that God created to be received. He didn't create all food to be received. The word sanctified as it is utilized in the verse you're referring to, verse 5, means set aside for use. Set aside for use for what? Whatever God created it for. He creates a scavenger to clean filth off the earth. And that's good. It's sanctified for that. And God looked and it was good. But don't eat the scavenger. He did not create it to be received. Ju Judy from Florida. Was Cain a hybrid since Satan was his father? Yes, uh, um, he was a hybrid in many ways. He was, he was chased from their very being. Um, Avern, Avernum from Kentucky. I, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Can you please explain Ephesians chapter 6 verse 7? Thank you. Um, please God and not man. Okay. If you please, this many people misunderstand. You're supposed to please God and not man. Don't be a man pleaser. Uh, you see, a lot of people say, "Well, am I, I like to get along with people." Well, if you're pleasing God, you will get along with the people you're supposed to. The rest, it doesn't matter. If you're pleasing God, good people will accept you. You don't have to worry about it. You are accepted. So uh, that's what the the. Chapter 6, verse 7 means is don't be a man pleaser, but please God. And then people that love God will be pleased with you. Okay, that simple. But always please God first. It's from him that all blessings flow. Uh, Benny from California. Can you tell me how old is our spirit? Since God knew us before we were born, when did he create our spirit? Well, you know, maybe, Benny, if you would read Proverbs chapter 8, where wisdom speaks. Wisdom was with God way back at the beginning. And wisdom kind of gives you a general run of when in that layout, that not, not by date, but by chronological order, when God created the, the very man himself, the souls. Lee from Wisconsin. What are the only two names for our Creator? My belief is that they are Yahweh and um, Emmanuel Yahweh of, for Christ. Well, you're, you're pretty close. Yahweh is the sacred name. comes from the etymology of I am that I am. It means He's, he's going to be wherever he wants to, whatever he wants to, whenever he wants to. But uh, Emmanuel was God with us, but his office and why he is named Jesus is Yahshua. And Yahshua being translated is Yahweh's Savior. He was sent to save all. So Yahweh and Yeshua are the sacred names. Uh, Cheryl from Connecticut, what are people doing with the Father that what are the people doing that are with the father that have passed on? Can a mother, father, husband, or wife come back and help us on earth? Well, um, you might read Matthew chapter 18, verse 10. What does Matthew 18, 10 say? It says, as far as God's saints are concerned, that means the one set aside, God's elect, that their angel has the face of God at any time they need help, that they need him. And who are the angels? When one passes away, they are as the angels. Why? Because they are in spiritual bodies. So uh, we just, that's, that's what the scriptures say, and that's what we can take from it. Many of the people, that one in cases that will approach John and the Revelator and Daniel, 
the prophet, uh, they fell down and started worshiping him. They said, whoa, hey, don't do that. We're, we're just like you are. We're just people. Just get up from there. Don't worship us. But they thought they were, they were in angelic form, right? a spiritual body. But uh, naturally, you're not supposed to worship angels. And nor would an angel allow you that God would send here to worship him. Uh, Holly from Georgia do you know of a place in the Old Testament where it talks of the five-month period? Well, yes, I do. Uh, it's, it's been adjusted a little bit, but in the Old Testament, you can read it in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. It's speaking of the gap theory, the 70th week. A week is seven days. And it lets you know that that seven days are split in half, three and a half and three and a half. This is why that Satan's same period of time given in moons, which he's, because he's of the night, 42 months, that's three and a half years. Okay. And then Christ, in teaching concerning the end times, and because God does love his children, especially the elect, he said, for your sake, I've shortened it. And... Revelation chapter 9, of course, tells us what it was sharp, shortened to. Um, actually, if you want to be very technical, the life of the consumer, the locust consumer, is five months. And you are told in Revelation chapter 9 that Satan will be here for five months with his locust army. So, so if, if you really look at in the depth, the Old Testament says it in that respect concerning the locust army. You have to know a little, a little bit about um, um, not only horticulture that the locust consumes, but um, the locust itself. Five months. Sarah from Kentucky, thank you so much for your ministry. You're very welcome. I learned more from you than any. Well, thank you. Where in the Bible does it say Passover is a high Sabbath? Well, actually, Passover became a high Sabbath to Christians in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 and 8 because Christ became our Passover. It doesn't get any higher than that in worshiping Passover. It was the blood of the lamb placed on the door that caused the death angel to pass over. It is the blood of Christ on the cross that causes Satan to have to pass over God's elect. He's got nothing with us. Marsha from California, thank you and your staff for broadcast. You're so welcome. Uh, I have been a student for so okay, good to have you aboard. I have a question about Revelation chapter 16, 21, about the great hailstones, hailstorm rather. The hailstones are over 100 pounds. What will this hailstorm destroy? Will this hailstorm destroy all man-made structures on earth or a part of the earth's, re is it a part of the earth's rejuvenation? No, no, no. Uh, rejuvenation comes in dimensions, okay? We are now not in the dimension of, of the spiritual bodies, or spiritual earth even. Um, but where, where do the hailstones fall? Only against the enemy, not, not God's children. There are two separate places that the hailstones will be released. Armageddon, that's the Valley of Megiddo, and Hamangog, the Valley of Gog, which is um, uh, two different wars, two different people, both fought by the living God, and he will destroy. Can you imagine, they say there's no God, he shows up and drops 100 pounds of ice on them, on them just rains it down. They're going to know there's a God. Uh, Nicole from New Mexico. I hope you can answer this on the air. My first question is about the lifespan of the locust. I get confused about it. I think that we are in the time of the fifth vial, the time of hunger for God's word 
and the locusts show up and eat it up before it can be consumed by people who need to hear it. Is that right? Well, they may try to, but <clears throat> there is nothing going to stop God's elect from teaching the truth, even down to the being delivered up before the Antichrist. The lifespan of the locust in the, in the um, uh, stage that you're concerned with is five months. Revelation chapter 9, but, but also that's not just in the Bible, that's an actual fact when you study the, the um, lifespan of the locust. Second question is about the difference between a vial, a seal, and a trump. A vial is poured out upon the earth so as it's something that happens. A seal is what we believe, and the trump is to announce from the word. Is that right? About, you're, you got it. But many, the seal is when you study God's word and you seal it in your mind. This is why God says to Satan in Revelation chapter 9, verse 4, don't you dare touch those that have the seal of God in their forehead means that know the truth. Why You can't touch us. Why, we're, not, we're not taken by him. We find him not to be tempting, but an abomination. We're his enemy, and he's our enemy. <clears throat> but the trump, a trumpet always announces to execute the command. That means when it comes to pass. The vials really are not poured out until near the end, because that is the wrath of God when the final day comes but they do culminate at the sixth of each. I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy studying God's word. Most of all, God loves you for it. Why? Because it makes his day. It's the letter he sent to you. When, he bless, when you bless him, he's certainly going to bless you. Now, we, we are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always bless you. Most important, though, you listen to me and you listen good, you stay in his word. Every day in his word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, he is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you. The Epistles of John three letters written by the Apostle John, that disciple whom Jesus loved. The tenderness of John's writings is marked by the number of times he begins the exhortations and warnings with, my little children, or little children. In fact, little children is written seven times in the first epistle alone. The contents of the first epistle are practical teaching in the light of the love of God. God is life, is light, is truth, is righteous, is love and we have fellowship with him through the Lord Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. The tenderness and love of John's writing continues in the second epistle as he encourages the elect lady and her children to love one another. He also writes, this is love, that we walk after his commandments. After these words of encouragement, John warns us that there are many deceivers entered into the world and explains how to identify these deceivers. Don't miss this opportunity to study the epistles of John with Pastor Arnold Murray.
Ezra and Nehemiah, these two books are necessary to understand the returning lecture on this subject. God promises, and you can count on it, that's exactly the way it will be, but most of his promises are conditional, meaning there's something you must do before you can expect that promise to apply to you. That's why so many people perhaps doubt God's word. They read something and they do not to fulfill their part of the condition. Example, we began with John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe, in other words, you had to believe or it didn't apply to you, everlasting life. So then we started with the very simple, and then we got into the deeper promises. And here we completed in Isaiah chapter 